Okay, uh, our next block is already starting. So please get seated if, if you are around here. Also, if you could please sit towards the center so that when new people come in, they have plenty of space to sit, as many of you already do. So thank you for that. Okay, our, our next speaker is Ruka Ralevich, and uh, he's going to be talking about software maintenance. And he's been doing a lot of software maintenance since 2010. He created a lot of web applications, both simple ones and complex ones. And he's going to introduce us to what happens when you inherit somebody's code base and you need to start maintaining it. How do you figure it out? Uh, what do you do? So, Luca, we're look, really looking forward to hearing what you have to tell, uh, tell to us. Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction. Uh, hello, my name is Luca, and I'm a software developer. And I'll be talking about uh, not only inheriting your uh, code base, but also leaving your code base in a maintainable state. So the next guy who comes doesn't have to find out where you live and kill you. So uh, I'm serious, this is no joking matter. So uh, it will be a short presentation with possibly a lot of rants. So bear with me if you can. If you cannot, bear with me also. Uh, my company who agreed to let me hear and speak to you does a lot of complex things and when I was brought in three years ago or something, I was told I will be in charge of garbage removal and I was like, okay, I did that. I removed my own garbage I, that I accidentally, accidentally put in and so I'm experienced. And I was like, okay, after three years, it's time to share my experience so you can also be a successful garbage removal specialist like I am. Now, this is what I did when I was younger. This is how I started uh, my first job. Fresh out of college, I was introduced to a code base and I did something like this. I Googled stuff. And these are all great books. I recommend each and every one of them. <laughs> they are a great learning ex experience. But uh, this is how you usually start. Uh, you take your code base, you git pull it or SVN, whatever it's called there, and you start your project. Now, the, for me, the hardest part was I was missing everything. I was missing database, I was missing configuration, I was missing a correct operating system for certain projects, libraries, not to mention. So this is hard. So <coughs> I started running tests. They all failed, so I skipped. <laughs> I mean, well, well, the project doesn't start, you cannot run tests, so you just skip everything and you Try to understand what is happening and what the application is doing by reading source code. You know, you just open a file at random and start reading source code. That can actually get you pretty far. I did three years of that and I got promoted three times. So this is great, great. So I recommend it. And then you just give up and take your task from Jira and you code, you don't run tests, of course, you let the production do it for you. I mean, they are paying, so they should bear some responsibility for the work, of course. And you do it, you commit it, you wait for bug reports and then you repeat the project and you can start from the beginning. So you can start the project, run tests, skip tests, understand what it is, what they said in the bug report. Again, by just poking around, you give up, you code, hope for the best, commit, and you repeat until you retire. That's great. Uh, unfortunately, I was fired, so <coughs> it was not so great. Yeah, I couldn't reach my goal, and my goal is retirement, as I hope all of you. So, in my next job, I did what I was supposed to do, and that was ask 
what it is that you are trying to solve, what problem are you solving, and why are your customers paying you? You don't ask uh, what it is that your code base is doing, but you ask what the problem is. So you start there. You start by understanding what it needs to be solved. And you start by talking to people. And mostly, you don't talk with other engineers. That's the wrong approach. You start by talking with those who are in charge of the product. We call them product manager, project owners. I call them PMs for something that's ugly to speak in creation, and that's probably why I use the shortened version. So you understand what it is that needs to be done by asking the right questions. And the right questions are hard because uh, usually the onboarding is not so great. They usually just tour you around the company, show your picture to everybody and say, this is our new colleague, he will be doing that and that. And then you say, okay, but is that all I'm doing or is there a, any higher purpose to my job? Uh, usually it's not, there's no higher purpose, it's just to get the job done and get your paycheck. So relax, it's not the end of the world. So. And I started asking, okay, so if this is what we are selling, if this is the thing that we need, so now I can understand what it is that I'm supposed to be doing as a problem solver, not a, as a code monkey. So then I ask somebody, please come and help me set up the application. Now, the, these are hard part because usually your code base should have working uh, readme that you can read to set up your project from the database setup, OS setup, libraries, uh, version of Python, and stuff like that. Because, come on, we are still using Python 2 in production, so you need to know your version of Python. So you get somebody to help you with that. And this is crucial step. If something is missing from the readme, or uh, there is a step uh, that somebody uh, assumes that you know, Write it down. The next guy who comes will be grateful. So, and then you, when you open up the code and you start working on your tasks, uh, this is the first thing you say, uh, yeah, the guy before me did a lousy job, so I'm gonna do better. Don't do that. There are reasons why the code base is in such a state. Maybe they were too young, too ex inexperienced. They were trying to fight the deadline and so don't put the blame. Sometimes, yeah, they are to be blamed, especially if you see them eye to eye, you can shout and create tickets, but uh, it's counterproductive most of the time. Now, when you start the project for the first time on your local computer, now you have various means. You have dockers, you have uh, software as a service platforms, you don't even have to run it on your local computer. Back in the Stone Age, when I was starting, you actually had to run everything locally. Mostly, you had to compile libraries for uh, your software version so you can have extensions that you needed and stuff like that. So, again, you write down each and every step how to start the project in the README and you need to keep it up to date. So if you don't do that, the next guy who comes will have to start the old fashioned way, just poking around. So don't do that. And then you run tests. This time you don't skip tests, you actually run them. See why they fail, uh, is it due to missing configuration? Again, update the README, update the configuration. So the next guy who runs tests can run, run them on the first start. And if they fail, find out why, don't skip. And of course, uh, all this is a process. It, it can take a couple of weeks. It's not something that you need to do in one day. It's not something that you should do in one day because that means that you understood nothing and you just want to code. That's the, for me, from my perspective, that is the wrong approach. You need to understand what it is, what it's doing, how it's doing, why the startup uh, time is so slow, for example, why it needs to connect to each and every database you have, and you can have multiple databases. You need to understand that uh, if something goes wrong when you are running it, it will go wrong on production, and usually on a Friday or Saturday when you're out, so be prepared. 
So make notes on what it is that you had to improve in all these steps so the next guy, and that will be you in two weeks, can actually understand and run the project again, simplify it. Uh, for example, now you can run Docker. Be, r put a Docker YAML file in it, run it, make sure it works, and then share that knowledge. And that is called contributing. So I hope you are all contributing. You're not just doing your job, but you are contributing. Uh, maintaining code base from somebody else or writing a code base from scratch can be challenging. Uh, what you need to do is make sure that all these steps that I mentioned are reproducible. You want to make sure that when you come back from vacation that your project can still run after you pull all the commits that happened in between from your colleagues and that everything runs. If something breaks, you don't want to call somebody because maybe he's on a vacation. And then if you need to call, if somebody calls you when you're on a vacation, uh, you know something went bad with what you did. So that's not something you want to happen. You want your vacations to be computer free. You want to go surfing or hiking or something. So please make sure that when you leave something, you leave it maintainable. And that is the approach I'm trying to do. It's not always easy. You skip steps, you forget. Sometimes you're just too lazy to do, and you assume that they will know what to do. That is usually, yeah, assumption is the mother of all, yes, failures, the F word. So uh, now that you did it, you go back to the beginning. You run. Again, you try to understand, is this what I did okay? You, then you don't get some, someone to show you. You show the next guy or your colleague, is this how this app is supposed to start? Is this what I'm, is this okay? Is, is this what we agree upon? You don't blame, you start the project. Now it's easy, you just press start and everything runs. Your database is up and running, your migrations are done, everything is up and running, your tests are running, and then you repeat this process and then you retire. Now, these are some stuff that you will, I, I hope uh, you do it while you are coding. That's uh, up-to-date change log of what changed in your code base, why it changed, and read me so that you can start the project easily. Uh, tests, uh, tests are important so that when you refactor, and you will refactor your code, uh, you know what to expect. So tests are not there to make sure that your software works. It's to make sure that your software will work when you change something. So I don't like to mix those two. Uh, your tests are something like a contract between you and the customer. So you are ensuring that what I build meets their expectations. That's what tests are for. Uh, somebody will say they are here to ensure software quality. Quality is something that needs to be thought of before you start coding. It, it's something that you put in a process. It's not. Uh, Tests are not there to assure quality. Tests are there to assure that when you change something, it will still work. That's all there, are, there is to it. Now, a uh, couple of years ago, when there were still live conferences, there was a talk about commenting your code. And it was divided. The audience was also divided between comment or not to comment. Some say, yeah, but uh, your uh, code should be self-explanatory. Yeah, well. Sometimes you need to make uh, adjustments so that your uh, software runs faster. You need to do some weird stuff to make it run uh, in parallel or stuff like that, so comment it. If you're in a doubt or uh, the code looks ugly, comment why it's there. And then, of course, uh, comments are part of your code, so if you change something, you need to update them. Uh, that's a lot of work, but again, that is to ensure the quality. So if you see that a comment is out of date in your code base, update the comment. Please, it's, it's for your sake also. So, and that's 
that's part of deep diving. The, the diving part is that uh, you need to survive. You, you need to go back to the surface and breathe. So if you dive too deep, you can drown, and drowning in uh, somebody else's code is not something that you want, especially if it's your own code you wrote two years ago. That's, yeah, that's also what happens. I should know. So, and then you come to the point that now you have this huge code base, and somebody asks, okay, the customer changed his mind, and we need to do it differently. You will refactor your code. A library will change. For example, now, like uh, the excellent talk before me said, now you have things in standard library. You don't have to import something. But standard library does not have to have the same interface as the library you used, so you need to refactor it. How do you do it? Well, again, you can do it the old-fashioned way. You can just skip everything, apply some new patches of code, delete all the tests that are failing, and ship it. Or you can actually understand what needs to be done, write tests before refactoring, keep all tests to compare, and then refactor. And everything should be green. If not, then ask yourself, what step am I missing? And then you go back. And of course, at all times, you can make notes what needs to be improved. When you are working on an old code base that's in production, you will notice sometime uh, pieces of code that are there and should be updated. And you don't have time for it now, so what you do is you create a ticket. And you say, okay, I find this, uh, this is an issue, I think it should be addressed, I will write a ticket, I will make a comment and say this code needs to be refactored, and the next time you have time, fix it. Uh, please don't just write code. If you see something around the code that you are changing, that needs to be changed, change it. Refactoring is something that needs to happen at all times. It's not something that you will schedule because nobody will give you time to refactor everything. So you, you keep it up to date. You refactor as you go along. And this can be hard because if you're young and you have no experience, you think that, oh, I, I can do better. I will write this loop to, to, run, in, uh, to run faster. Uh, it will uh, speed up. Uh, it will use less queries. And then you do it. And the next guy comes and cannot understand your code, so he rewrites it again. That's what comments are for. So you comment, this is what it was. I thought that it should be faster, and this is the result. This is the code that runs faster from the previous one. Uh, sometimes you can just put it in commit message, if it's simple enough. But that's, that's something that you need to do. You, you need to make sure that the code base you are building, you are maintaining, uh, is always as best as it can be in that moment of time. So that depends on the amount of time you have, the amount of knowledge you have, and, well, how lazy you are. Yeah. So, again, that's called contribution. You do a bit extra work, so you don't have to do it two weeks from now. Also, ask questions, please. Ask your colleagues, ask the project owners, ask the management. Why is this this way? Can it be improved? I see that we are running on bare metal. Do we need software as a service? Can we outsource this to another library or another product? Do we actually need to implement this? Or can we use an existing application. So those are all valid questions. And you should be asking all those questions and more if you think of more questions. So, and this is uh, the main part of every diving. So every diver will tell you, you need to rest. So when you do all these steps, it can take a couple of months and then you see your results Take a rest. Go on a vacation. Don't answer your phone. Uh, believe me, it will clear up your mind. And if you are working on a complex feature, on a complex code, 
don't try to do it in one go. Write some code today, stop, rest, and then come back at it tomorrow. You, you will have uh, another view, and before that, ask your uh, colleagues to review what you did yesterday. So code review is something that should be done on a regular basis, not as part of the process that you just you know check, yeah, I reviewed it and that's it. Code reviews are there to help you to see things that you missed because uh, you can miss th things. Sometimes it can lead to bugs, sometimes it can lead to unexplained behavior because you accidentally overrun a variable that was introduced 200 lines above in the same function that has 500 lines. So you need your rest, you need your colleagues, and you need to communicate. So communication is great. You ask questions, you answer them, you review other people's code. If you are used to working with external libraries, I hope that you are reading their documentation also. If not, how are you using those libraries? That's not something that you should skip. So reading, asking questions should be part of your daily routine, not just code. And now I'm ti it's time for me to rest, so please do your job and ask me questions. Thank you, Luca. So now we'll look at the questions from Slido. And the one the with the first one is great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. What is the ugliest thing you have ever left in the code base that you still feel ashamed for? Well, uh, <clears throat> that's a tough because I did so many shameful things that, uh, but at the top of my head was a part of something that should have been asynchronous, asynchronous uh, and used Redis as a communication channel to maintain uh, was done in such a convoluted way that I actually had no way to debug it. So if it broke, I would just add more layers of code. So one function turned out to be 200 lines of try accepts. And that's not the worst part. <laughs> I wrapped it into other functions. <laughs> we try accept. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> okay, the next one. What do you advise not to try on first days in new work with a new code base? <clears throat> Git push. <laughs> 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 Again, I speak from experience. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do if there is no one to ask how the app works, so the previous authors are no longer at the company and the app is broken? Uh, yes, uh, I did that. Uh, I was introduced as the only, well, I can say I was the IT department. <laughs> I was everything, so, and they just said, uh, it's on production and it's not working. So I asked, okay, is there any IP address there? Uh, we think so, we can ask the client. Okay, so that was the red flag. And I said, okay, then I will speak directly to the client. And that is something that you should not be doing when you're young. Speaking to a client is something that will lead to you saying yes to everything. <laughs> so I did uh, what I did. Okay. I did, uh, <coughs> I did this. I found out the IP address. I pulled the code to my computer, started poking around and it took me a couple of days to, to do it right. And of course, I did not update README, I did not add changelog or meaningful commit messages. They were like, 
it works? No, it doesn't. Fix for the commit from before. And it took me one year to actually uh, make it run okay -ish. And then uh, the next guy came and he said, okay, how do you start your project? And I said, oh, <laughs> go take a vacation because this is gonna be a long, a long winter. And it was, they left that after two weeks. No, 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 it was working, but uh, I was fixing bugs for a year and adding new features for a year alone. And I left it in such a state that it was horrible. Horrible. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, but uh, that's, that's the only thing you can do. If the code base is uh, written as I wrote it, the only thing you can, you can do is poke around and see if it will work better. Well, you hope for the best. <laughs> Next one. How do you identify dead or unused code and when to remove or reduce code? Well, you can use external libraries that can actually run uh, traces of your software and make sure that something is called or not, or like I do, add a logs. So log, here I am, somewhere, meaningful, and just grab, grab logs occasionally, occasionally. Yeah, that's. And then uh, also, you can just remove tests or uh, remove part of parts of code and run tests. And if no tests fail, so it's probably not that important code, yes. <laughs> Very practical. <laughs> when you update readmes frequently, uh, they, can, they can become very long. Uh, and then nobody reads them anymore because of the size. So how do you filter what, it, what you put in the README? Just the basic stuff. So README should be uh, what this project does, what, are, what is required to start. And if you have more than 100 lines, add a README or a structure or a file somewhere on the web. So don't make your README's uh, Ulysses, it should be a tweet-sized something that just helps you start the project. It should contain only necessary information to start the project, nothing more and nothing less. So if you cannot start your project by reading README, add until you can. And that's it, stop there, that's, that's enough. Everything else needs to be in separate documentation pages. When starting a new project, Maintaining a change log or a readme is frustrating because everything changes rapidly. Therefore, the docs become out of date in no time. What do you do? Give up. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. I did that and it's not working. So you need to take time to update. Uh, believe me, you will be grateful to yourself. We have plenty more questions, and I suggest that you that you take them directly to Luca. Luca, thank you so much. Mikrobit je programovateľný mini počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého.
Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.